Iowa, John Deere, Arthur C. Clarke, and small business computers. What do they all have in common? Well, you're about to find out. One of the first and most unique personal business computers built did not come from the Silicon Valley, but rather the Mississippi Valley in Davenport, Iowa. It was a culmination of efforts between a local computer store owner and the great-great-granddaughter of John Deere. And now, let me introduce to you the Archives Business Computer and Archives Incorporated, which began in 1979. Hi, my name is Paul Keller and I work for Archives Computers. The following is an interview with two of the key engineers that took place on April 12th, 2022 at a Davenport, Iowa public library. And now, here's our story. Welcome Bob Miller and Jim Seam, both uh, engineers from Archives Computers. And uh, welcome guys. Thank you. Hi Paul. So, um, 1979, there was realistic controls. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about them. Well, like I said they they, man, they basically manufactured. A, uh, they were doing software and stuff like that. They actually, what they did is they they put together systems with Intel S100 boards in a big chassis. You know, yeah. before they had the S not S100, but the big the double bus. Remember those the old Intel big monster, you know, mm -hmm. Intel SBCs. And they were doing software for that. They inter interfaced a hard disk, a Trident hard disk to it and stuff. And then they started getting into micros. So wh why did they close down? Uh, I don't even know why. I think it just they just ran out of money and stuff like that, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you worked there, and right. you helped them with software development. Mm -hmm. And then Mrs. Hewitt uh, was presented with the opportunity to, to purchase uh, a, a, the company versus mm -hmm. her uh, investing into the memory bank computer store. And there was an auction, and the intent was to look and see if they could buy stuff on the cheap. And I guess the auction didn't quite go as they had expected, so they decided to start a computer company on their own. And then they reached out to you and several other employees, correct? Well, there wasn't a whole lot there to buy, okay? We used CPM, okay, and the case was all metal, okay? It was sharp, and you but you cut your hands all the time. You tried to take it apart, but it still used CPM in that, so. So, Bob, you work for a company in West Liberty, Iowa. Yeah, uh, Digital Sports Systems. And I had designed a uh, small, more of a hobbyist S100 CPM based system for them. And uh, uh, should I talk about the open house? Yeah, so tell us about the open house. Okay, well, the way I found out about uh, uh, this company was I went to an open house for a, a local computer store that was opening. And um, I was interested in computers, always wanted one, never had one. So I, I'm talking to uh, one of the principals behind this company, and he says, well, we want to start building computers locally. And I said, well, isn't that interesting? I just got done designing a system in, in uh, West Liberty, Iowa. And, uh, and that particular system was kind of done on a shoestring. I designed... I designed every bit of it, all the circuit boards, everything, uh, hardware-wise, was, was my design. And that was an S100-based system. Can you explain what S100 uh, means? S100 was a uh, standard backplane for boards, and they were, um, they had 100 pins, 50 on each side, and uh, uh, address, data, control signals all went through that backplane. And, um, and and it had been an, a very early uh, standard for computer design. So it's kind of a way to extend the motherboard that accommod that would accommodate inter. Yeah, actually, board. actually, it's it's the idea is that you spread out the motherboard in, into several uh, into, uh, for, for example, one of the boards was the processor board, and that had the processor and buffers and things. Then there were memory boards. There Nine were. Boards, yeah. I know boards, yeah, serial I.O. Um, uh, if, if you're controlling a, a display, there'd be a display interface board. All those boards were separate boards. So in 1979, Archives Computers Forms, you guys are two of the early people on board to help design this computer system. Okay. And it was designed in the back of that retail computer store memory bank, yeah, correct? Right. right. Yeah. What was that like? 
Well, it was it was actually um, for me it was kind of nice because it was uh, uh, I I had people coming to me saying, um, "What do you need?" And uh, uh, so they they built a, a, a little lab yeah. in the back and uh, bought a couple of nice scopes. And uh, back then, digital storage scopes didn't exist. Um, but uh, uh, they, they got me the things I needed, and most of my time was sitting drawing schematics uh, until we could get them built. So Archives Computers was owned by Mrs. Patricia Deere Wyman Hewitt, who is the great-great-granddaughter to John Deere. So it's kind of nice to have those resources available. I suppose if you needed things, just ask. But um, her husband was William Hewitt, who happened to be the CEO of, of John Deere. And, um, but other than sharing a few of their board members, there was no John Deere connection. Some people had said we're part of John Deere or there was, you know, their, their, their people were helping us get started. But you guys were pretty much the, the backbone or, you know, you got to have software and hardware. And that's why I wanted to, to interview you, you guys. There really wasn't much of a connection between John Deere and Archives, really, except Mrs. Ewan. Right. I mean, there, we never went over there and they got any help or anything, or and I didn't anyway. The, there, was, <clears throat> there was one engineer, and, and it's been 40 years ago, I don't remember his name, but he worked in the... Uh, uh, Tech Center. T Tech yep. Center for John Deere. And he would come over once a month or whatever and look at my schematics and, and we'd talk about them and he'd say, yeah, that looks good. That looks like So he'd grade work. your schematics. Well, I think, I think they wanted some feedback that I knew what I was doing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Before so, we go yeah. too much further, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. So um, then there was the move from Memory Bank on Brady Street in Davenport to 404 West 35th Street and that's where realistic controls had started, and then you guys are moving down there to set up production. So what That's was right. that like? It was an empty shell, and Mrs. Hewitt brought in her carpenter and her designer and all her, this kind her, of stuff. Her painter. Her painter, her <laughs> painter, her architect. And, you know, in my office, they put this gigantic lunar landscape in. Okay. Oh, yeah. You remember that one? Yep. And well, was that in your office? Yeah. Or was that in well, the front door? No, the lunar landscape was in my office way back down the hall. Okay, but then my office moved later on to the front, and they put production in there. Okay, there was a mural at the front door. I don't remember what that. Yeah, was. she she had, it was yes. all on. She had them all mounted on boards, you know, and, and oh, mounted on okay, the wall. Yeah, okay. And that, and then she painted behind the um, the, uh, uh, the reception area purple because she thought that was my favorite color, you know. And Shelley was sitting there, you know, <laughs> stuff were there. But other, you know, she just liked all. She liked being around the younger kids. What were your first impressions of her? You go first. Well, his first impression is very, very nice, okay? And, uh, uh, you know, she was very, you know, she raised horses, so she was kind of a, you know, a, a husky woman and stuff like that, but she was a very, very nice person. Yeah. She, she was always yeah. nice to me. Yeah. She was, uh, she was a very big mm -hmm. person. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. she was tall. Yeah, yeah her, her size could be very intimidating. People. Yeah. Now, see, I started in June... June of 1980, and I just heard about her. I had never met her, never saw her, and I'm working at the tech bench, and I felt this large looming presence over me, and I turned on, and I know I jumped, and I knew right away it was Mrs. Hewitt, just from the descriptions of her. But she was always very nice to yeah, us. Yeah, always very, very nice, a deep voice, and like I said, she liked, she liked the horses. What, what did she raise? What kind of horses were they? Do you remember? Arabians. Um, Arabians, that's right. She also liked dogs, Jack Russells. Yeah. Remember, she'd come in with her Jack Russells. Oh, I didn't really yeah. remember that. I don't remember the dogs. Yeah. I remember the, the, the uh, her horses. If cigarettes. she'd come in with the horse, I bet <laughs> So I want to talk about the unique cabinet and design. Uh, Jim, you mentioned realistic controls was a piece of sheet oh, yeah. metal with sharp All edges. Oh, yeah, pro -ish sheet metal. The only thing that had wood on it was the processor technology. Remember, it had the wood sides? <clears throat> okay, but almost all of them were just basically sheet metal, and that's all there was, okay? I don't think people realize 1979 was the Wild West of the microcomputers. Yeah. You know, it's the very beginning, right? Mm -hmm. But there were a lot of kit-built computers, and there wasn't a lot of thought put into the boxes, but... The archives was very unique. Yeah. Um, the material I, is quality. 
it was heavy. I yeah. built several. I built MSI 8080. I built a processor technology. I built, built, a, uh, built a vector graphics. Uh, you know, back at Realistic Controls, not for archives and stuff. Out of kits. But John John Jevons did a great job of designing right. the cabinet, yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and none of them had a monitor built in. They were all monitors on. Or the monitor was built in along with the keyboard. And uh, mm. that was awkward. A lot of the systems were one piece, but uh, Bob, uh, you designed a keyboard that was detachable with a long cord. You could set it on your lap. Tell I us about really that. I design that keyboard. That was, that was a, a product that Microswitch uh, had created. And they, they knew they wanted a separate keyboard. And um, so we, we started looking at people that made keyboards. And Microswitch, uh, one of the things about it, we knew it was, it was going to be essentially a fairly high-end machine. It wasn't going to be cheap. And we didn't want a cheap $20 keyboard on it. So we went with a, a Microswitch Hall Effect sensor board. Explain that. Uh, a Hall Effect sensor is something... A Hall Effect basically senses a magnetic field. And, uh, and when you push the plunger on a key, the magnet would move down to the Hall Effect sensor, which would send a signal to the the motherboard that says that uh, somebody just pushed A, uh, letter A. And, um, and so all those keys had Hall Effect sensors, individual magnets and individual Hall Effect sensors, and that's how it worked. The big thing about it was that the function keys across with the with movable yep. caps, so we could actually put WorkStar functions into into that. And I tried to research it. I don't know of any computers before 1979 that had a separate function row across the top. And now you just take it for granted. There's mm -hmm. your, you know, your today what it's called the F row, your F your F keys, um, but the um, dedicated function rows, and you could put that template on top. And we used uh, it came with a WordStar template, but you could change it out. Essentially what it was is, is that the keyboard had the function keys and had the regular keys and stuff like that, but it was basically an RS-232 link that went to the back of the computer, okay? And so I'd had, I basically defined the codes for the function keys and then incorporated into word processing software and, and that kind of stuff later. Initially, there was a solenoid that would tap well, out, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. and so you had yeah. the feeling. now. Again, before computers, people's only experience with the keyboard was a typewriter. Mm -hmm. right. And your manual typewriter, you had that cl right. clicky clack. Like click. Yeah, yeah. As, you, as, you, as the hammer hit the paper. And even on electrics, you, know, you had that physical action happening, which made the sound. Mm -hmm. So people wanted the reassurance when they hit the key that something was happening. Mm -hmm. so, so it started with the solenoid, and then later, what did you do? You replaced the solenoid with the speaker. Put a little I think so. It was keyboard. a long time ago. Did I don't I remember. I think we get rid of the solenoid because yeah. of the mechanical thing, and they would just put a click on the speaker. I think. Yeah, some people I don't think were real in favor of the solenoid. No, I don't. You know, yeah. Well, they like to, the IBM always had a, a mechanical keyboard to click, 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 yeah. click, click. You know, yeah. and so. But I think we went with the speaker. We used to do sound programs. Remember? Uh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. You know yeah. the yeah. music box dancer. <laughs> okay, so we talk. This question is for you, Jim. Uh, CPM, right. tell us about that. Well, CPM what, was what very is? popular at the time. Okay, what was it? Uh, it was basically a control program for microcomputers. It was by Digital Research out in uh, oh god, what was the name of that place? It's out in California. Uh, anyway, but uh, you know that was that was more or less the standard. Before that, on the older systems, they used anybody's operating system. Microsoft wasn't around at that point in time. They had like K2F DOS by Kenneth Wells, and then we went with CPM and that. And uh, it basically did, was the operating system for the disk formats and all that kind of stuff. So, Shortly we're going to talk about computers in the day, but most of those computers at the time all used, for the most part, all used CPM. If they had an operating system, they had C so the problem is someone didn't even have an operating system. You know, you had to put in everything you wanted to do by hand and that kind of stuff. But when it came to operating systems, there were a couple before CPM, but CPM was the predecessor of the Microsoft ones. So we had uh, CPM for operating system, and then, Bob, what did we have for the processor? We used a uh, Zilog Z80 uh, running at 4 megahertz for the processor. Didn't sound very fast, did it? No. Well, it was better. Uh, have, <laughs> you only had two for the 8080, or was it maybe one, you know, at that point in time, okay? The thing about the Z80, it's expanded instruction set, number one, and number two was faster. But that was the standard processor, too, for a lot of the competitors, right? No, a lot of them still used 8080s. 80s, yeah. And actually, when uh, when IBM came out with their machine, 
they used a 4.77 megahertz uh, Z80, and we were faster. Not Z80, 8080, yep. and we were faster than they were. I want to talk about connectivity. Uh, you know, we talk about communicating to a printer and mm -hmm. different manufacturers. You had to have different interface cables. Um, but when it came to, well, for example, there wasn't an internet. Um, if you wanted to connect to the outside world, you would use a dial-up modem mm -hmm. and perhaps uh, communicate with a bulletin board service, which mm -hmm. is just a very rudimentary way of communicating with other people through through an external service. Is that what you would say? I guess I guess for our what was for us was most of the people had a like a Bell two twelve or a one hundred three modem okay and they hooked up with the serial connection okay uh, we had boards that went in okay and we had the Hayes board what was the other one the one that went faster oh golly do you remember that one or not no. so oh, when we was. talk about modems people don't know what a modem is so. Modulator, um, demodulator. Well, that's even more. <laughs> Worse. Yeah. So explain what a modem was and how it was used. The modem basically you took had electronic signals, okay, and it would basically uh, turn them into tones that would go over the uh, the Bell system network, okay. Because you couldn't send actual digital signals across at that time and stuff, so you had to have tones. So I wanted to talk about communication because that leads us into the next topic, Arthur C. Clarke. Mm -hmm. Um, who was Arthur C. Clarke? Well, Arthur C. Clarke wrote 2001 and 2010, okay? Uh, the books, and they, they were and they're both converted into movies and stuff like that. But see, Arthur C. Clarke basically, uh, uh, not discovered, but the, the, put the theory for, of communication satellites. You know, mm -hmm. GPS, yeah. communi not GPS, but geosynchronous you know, communication satellites. Other than that, stuff to track them and stuff, if they were geosynchronous, it was a lot easier to communicate. So how did archives play a role in that? Well, what happened was, is he was down in Sri Lanka, okay, and he needed a computer system because it was like the, some anniversary of the of the communication satellite, okay, and he sent the last chapter of his book, okay, from an archives <clears throat> through the communication satellite to his publisher in New York. And we know that because when you go to the back of the book, right, it the last it, page, yep. it does credit the archives business computer. Yep. Here. He did some of the work on a different computer, okay, and but he did the, the final work. He liked the archives. <clears throat> I think he called it the Archie. We'll get into software in a minute, but the, one of the nice things is about, we just talked about the, the computer, the dedicated function row, which was, those were keys that were used in WordStar, which was uh, a very popular WordStar, mm -hmm. or word processing, word processing program, word, yeah. uh, program in the day. And uh, WordStar, we had some sort of arrangement with WordStar, because in their marketing materials, if you research that, you'll see the archives business computer, mm -hmm. where in their print material. Really? Yeah. yeah. So. Basically, WordStar, made the core of the word processing, okay? But there was an interface where we interfaced our keyboard with the function keys and stuff. And before that uh, was a software program that we did use, but called Electric Pencil. Right. Mm -hmm. A lot of people talk about Electric Pencil. That predated WordStar, I believe. That's a whole topic by itself, okay? There, there's no proportionally spaced characters and all this kind of stuff, and printing was, was difficult, you know, and that kind of stuff. But WordStar kind of you know, solved a little bit of that. So I just want to talk about uh, software at the time. You just couldn't go into a store and buy a software package off the shelf. Uh, one, everybody had their own data formats. Um, but if they wanted a WordStar program, we made it available. Well, we go ahead and you we tell us how we did that. It. Basically what it is, we customized it. They sent out the core on, on eight inch floppies, okay? Which we had an eight inch floppy machine. I don't know if you want to mention the name or not, okay? Thinker Toys is what it was, okay? And it had two, had two eight inch floppies you know, in my office there. And what we did is we downloaded that to the five and a quarter inch floppies and then did, did the customization. The nice thing about it was with the with the RS-232 keyboard, those function keys had special codes. But the problem with ASCII is once you have all the characters, you don't have any special you don't have any special characters that aren't used, okay? And so we had the option of being able to use those extra characters to, to make the function keys. Up until that time, you had to like control shift something or control, you know, to, to, to do like reforming a paragraph or something. I don't think people realized uh, that there were eight inch floppy disk drives. Those were our masters yep. back in the day. You couldn't very well, you know. I've still got some. <laughs> yeah, they were pretty bulky, but I know we kept them in a special place and every those were the master copies that we made our mm -hmm. copies from. We also had SuperCalc. 
No, SuperCalc was Apple. I think we had VisiCalc. No, that's right, SuperCalc. You're right. Yep. SuperCalc. Super yep. Bob, I want to come back to you on the hardware. You mentioned 4 megahertz, but mm. the memory, uh, talk about the memory capacity on the computer. Well, the archives has 64K of memory, Doesn't which is like a lot. La laughably small nowadays. But All systems but, 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 64K. But, yeah. but that was the most you could put on a... Uh, uh, like an 8080 or a Z80 system, because that's all the addressing they had until people came up with schemes to provide virtual memory. Like bank switching and stuff. Yeah. Right, right. Then and, and that required soft, additional software support and hardware support to uh, produce uh, bank switching like that. So in the early days, people were purchasing this computer, perhaps mostly for word processing, mm -hmm. maybe spreadsheet. But even though you had such small memory and what would be considered today very slow speed, mm -hmm. it seemed to perform the calculations rather quickly. I mean, you people weren't complaining because it took uh, 20 minutes for their spreadsheet to run. You could hit a couple of keys and, and still do mass calculations, right? One of the things about it back then is a lot of the software was written in assembly language, and uh, which is right as close to the hardware as you can get. Now everything's written in compilers, and, uh, and, and it's got uh, seven layers of indirect jumps and things in there that, that slow it all down. So you buy a gigahertz machine and it runs like it's uh, 10 megahertz. It's like overhead, okay? You know, all, all the stuff I wrote was in assembly. You know, machine language and assembly language, okay? And so that it ran fairly fast and fairly efficiently. Mm -hmm. But if you went up with the compilers, okay, then you had to compile the stuff and then put all the overhead in, and you ended up with, you know, a lot of slower up. Yeah. Um, another word processing package and vertical market of ours was Westlaw. Uh, Westlaw is what attorneys used to look Westlaw up. Westlaw is a case legal press. database. Yes. Yep. And it had its own uh, template for the function keys as well, correct? I believe so, yep. Yeah. When you did, the, we, we, what we marketed it for was like office, like lawyers' offices and businesses and stuff like that, okay? And for the lawyers, the Westlaw was really great because otherwise they had some clunky computer with a, with a terminal and all this kind of stuff. Now they could access it right from the same machine they did their word processing on, you know what I mean? And they could, you know. <clears throat> let, let, let's talk about price, too. So the, uh, yeah. the computer the with the printer system was somewhere between six and seven thousand dollars back in 1982, 83, yeah. which I, is equivalent to eighteen thousand five hundred dollars today. I think I think that was that with or without a hard drive, because a hard drive added quite a bit. Yeah, a hard disk drive would have been more. That would have been for the Model Two double sided disk yeah, drives. Yeah. So we didn't talk about the disk yeah. drives. Right, you got the single sided, the double sided, then you had the hard disk. Okay, the five, so the model five one, gig, mega, five megabyte hard disk. The very first model that we sold was the model one with two single sided floppy disk drives, yeah. and they were. Well, we use quad density diskettes. I know this terminology is not going to be familiar to probably anybody, but what that meant was we were putting more, On one more side. data than the competitors, and so much so that our disk drives had to be dead on for alignment. That's why I was brought on, because we would order the drives, but they weren't within their own specs, and we were maxing it out, so everything had to be dead on. The reason they were faster and held more is because I did deblocking on the sector size. At that time, everything was 128 byte sectors, and it took forever, because every time you went to one, you had to wait for the disk to spin around and all this kind of stuff, and I put 1K sectors on, and then deblocked it in the operating system. You know, into one into several 128k sectors. You're getting a little over my head, okay. but basically, what you did is you added more data per right. sector. Right. Every every time you have a 128 byte sector, you had to have a gap so it could find it again. Okay. So by using 1k sectors rather than 128. Okay. okay now, I'm... now basically, what happened is you could put more on every track, and that multiplied by well, it was 74 to begin with, and then 80 later on, right? Mm -hmm. you know. You talked about the price. I missed question 12. So question 12, um, what impact? did IBM have in the industry? You know, I know in early on, they weren't, even though they were a big company, they weren't seriously, um, they weren't taken seriously in the, I don't think. Well, I, I remember two things when the original uh, IBM's PC came out. Now we talk about the 8088, was it? The 8088, yeah. yeah. Okay. It was, uh, we benchmarked it against the archives, and the archives was not a huge, Mount faster, but it was faster. And the other thing is that we had done noise testing on archives uh, with a, a, 
uh, a sound meter. Yeah. No, 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 no. Oh. Electric. Okay, electric. Electrical. Electrical. Uh, e EMF. Uh, or is that not uh, right? Basically, You're the engineer. I'll leave that to you. Basically, testing its uh, its uh, resistance to damage through transients coming in through the power line, and um, and when we tested it, the archives. You, the, the piece of test equipment we had, you could crank it all the way up and it, the archives was unfazed. But the PC kind of had a meltdown about three quarters of the way up. Hmm. And uh, so it, it was not as robust, uh, at least not the original PC. They had supply issues. So I don't think they were a real threat in, or a concern in 81, 82, but by 83 they were getting their act together. Well, see, a lot of the stuff, they came out with MS-DOS, okay? And a lot of the stuff was written for CPM. So you just couldn't get off-the-shelf software. You had to have special, you know, had to especially tuned for... Basically, you commute with the operating system with certain function calls and things like that, okay? And they were all different from Microsoft. So what you had to do is you had to basically re-adjust uh, the program to actually work. See, there again, most of the stuff was written in assembly language, so it, you know, it wasn't just a drop and, you know, plug-and-play type stuff. So I talk about the IBM because that really was the demise for a lot of the computers and competitors at the time. Right. Um, but honestly, somebody needed to come along and standardize. Well, a lot of the uh, systems of that were uh, somewhere between a hobbyist system and a business system. And, you know, they, they kind of ran the gamut. Well, then... Uh, IBM came up with theirs, and everybody everybody uh, saw that as a business system. And uh, so all the guys that were doing the lower-end stuff were kind of uh, pushed out of the market. Okay, so in the early 1980s, you had Compaq, K-Pro, Radio Shack, TRS-80. Um, but we were talking earlier, a lot of those computers were really for home use or mm -hmm. hobby issues. Would you agree with that? Not really. The Compact uh, uses a 6802. I think Apple uses 6802. I think the, uh, the Compact 6, uses 6802 or 6502. 6502. You're yeah. right. 6502. Were they all CPM based? Not all of them. No. Yeah, uh, and see, there, there again, you, you have the stuff that covered such a wide range. And so the other thing that set us apart, we were, you know, our name was Archives Business Computer. We were a business computer. We weren't mm -hmm. really designed mm -hmm. to play games on and. And uh, it was all, all about business, but the price made it prohibitive for a lot of the hobbyists mm -hmm. or home users. Oh, uh, yeah. One thing I don't think I mentioned when we were talking about price, but standalone word processors in the day were in the twenty thousand dollar range, whereas you could spend less than that if you were a small business owner mm -hmm. and get a computer that could do, you know, most of your business functions, payroll, mm -hmm. and your, your word processing and spreadsheets. What, what do you think led to the demise of the archives business computer? Uh, well, a lot of it, of course, was uh, um, IBM developing their PC. And I know a lot of people said, well, you know, that's, that's a business computer. And, and really ours was, too. In fact, ours was really a better business computer than the original PC. But, of course, we didn't have, you know, a billion dollars behind us to to develop the next three generations. So uh, eventually, uh, uh, we, were, we were just shoved out of the market, just like everybody else. And um, my personal feeling, I think a lot of it was with Mr. Hewitt got uh, nominated to the ambassador of Jamaica. Oh, that was part of it, yeah. yeah because, yeah. because you know, all of a sudden she had to move down to Jamaica and all this kind of stuff, and it wasn't, you know, it was more of a, pain to do business that far, you know, she liked to come in and talk to the young kids, you know what I mean? She would sit there and talk for me for, you know, a long time and stuff, and with Bob and that kind of stuff, just to kind of be around the young kids with the fresh ideas and that kind of stuff. What was it like working at Archives? I got along fine, but there again, they, you know, they don't feed the programmers and the engineers very much. They're back in the back room, you know, that kind of stuff. It, it was, yeah. it was like I say, I, I, I thought it was a company I'd retire from. Yeah, and not just spend, what was it, three and a half years yeah. or whatever. I thought so too, yeah. Yeah, it, it, uh, it and, and, I, and I still think uh, if, if we had kept going, uh, we could have been, you know, Compact or HP or 
you know, one of those guys been a big name in the PC business, but uh, they just saw that as a big competitor, and we were out. And what happened to Archives was no different than what happened to K Pro and Compact and Radio Shack and, and and the others. I hate to group us with those hobbyist home home computers, but uh, the, but if you weren't IBM, yeah, it was kind of it was kind of that that feeling. If you weren't IBM, well then who are you? You know, you know we had a good product. I think it would have worked out just fine and stuff like that. But the you know the thing about it was is you don't have didn't have the big name. You know when you think computers. You, you bring an IBM, what do they think, you know? Somebody has to, if a purchasing agent has to make a decision, oh, we got archives down here, we got IBM over here. Okay, if I pick IBM and it messes up, you know, what was better, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you want to keep your job, yeah, right? that's what I'm saying, you know. <laughs> All right, well, thank you guys for coming. I appreciate it. Well, I hope you enjoyed our story. Special thanks to Jim Seam and Robert Miller for their time and recollections in making this video possible. This documentary was originally requested by the Smithsonian Institute over 30 years ago when I donated my first archives business computer. And if you don't mind, please like this video and subscribe to our channel so you'll be notified of future videos as they become available. And we'd also love hearing from you if you don't mind leaving a comment below. And special thanks to everyone, including all the past employees who helped make this project possible.